Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Maureen Anderson from Beaumont Integrative Medicine, and uh, we're going to be talking about brain health today. This was um, a challenge to my brain, getting up uh, and connected on a new platform, but it takes a village, and we had a great team. So uh, welcome to the session, and we will get started. So uh, brain health means different things to different people from cradle to grave. So in young children, we worry about autism, we worry about ADHD, we worry about developmental delay. Then we worry about anxiety, depression in our preteens and teens, and uh, then in the you know bipolar and schizophrenia and OCD. And then of course, in the twilight of life, we or sooner we worry about dementia and, and Parkinson's and things like that. So uh, when I was in medical school, the we were taught that if you kill brain cells, that's it, you're done. Uh, and now we know that that's not true. So there's lots that we can do to optimize our cognitive and mental function. So that's what we're gonna talk about today in the time we have. So this is kind of the, the general definition of brain health. You wanna be able to pay attention, perceive, recognize, learn, remember, communicate, to problem solve and make decisions, to move around and to regulate your emotions. So this is just a fun thing. Can you spot the mistake? And I can't tell how many of you are there, but at any rate, the word spot is there twice. So it's just a little brain teaser to wake you up. Okay, so we're first gonna talk about the genetics of uh, dementia. You may have heard about this ApoE4 gene. Uh, people have talked about it a lot because it increases risk of dementia. And so, uh, especially if you have two copies and you're female, there's up to a 50% risk of dementia. Uh, but here's the good news. Genetics aren't everything. We can influence the expression of our genes. So if, in Nigeria, for instance, that has the highest population of people with the ApoE4 gene, yet they have one of the lowest incidences of dementia. So that tells us that diet and environment are playing a big role in the expression of these genes. So when somebody, uh, especially in, in midlife or beyond, is developing changes in mentation, we as physicians have uh, an obligation to really be looking for medical causes of changes and not just writing it off to dementia. Uh, medications are a common cause and some of our very common medications. I think the most common one is antihistamines. And... Uh, and we'll, you find these in allergy meds, but you also find them in sleep medication. So Tylenol PM has uh, Benadryl in it. So you want to be careful of that. The benzodiazepines are things like uh, Ativan and Xanax, and then sleep meds like your Ambien. And you know what about statins and, and opiate medications and things like that, beta blockers like metoprolol. So it behooves us to take a very critical look at what medication somebody's taking to make sure that that's not what's contributing to the change in cognition. Then there are other health issues as well. Obviously, we wanna make sure there's not a brain tumor or underlying depression or Lyme disease. Uh, something as simple as a urinary tract infection can impact uh, cognition and, and B12 deficiency, hypothyroidism. Uh, sleep apnea is a big one. People don't like to go get sleep studies. They don't like CPAP, but it can be life-changing if that's the underlying cause. So when you look at the studies, there are several risk factors for dementia that can be modified. So this is one study that showed hearing loss, level of education, physical inactivity, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, smoking, social isolation. Uh, there was another study that showed of all those things, blood pressure control, exercise, and cognitive stimulation had the biggest impact but there are various studies. So we're gonna be talking about several of these today. So this is our multimodal approach. So basically food, sleep, exercise or movement or activity, if you don't like the E word, stress management and social connection is a big one. All right, so we'll start with nutrition and digestion because Hippocrates, who was kind of the grandfather of, of modern medicine, said that all disease begins in the gut. And now it turns out per research currently, uh, he's probably absolutely right. 
there are many functions of the bacteria in our gut. One is it's a physical barrier against invaders. Uh, the other is it influences the immune response. 70% of our immune system is in the gut. So when you have immune inflammatory conditions, asthma, allergies, eczema, other skin conditions, uh, even joint pain, a lot of that is coming from the gut. The, certainly the gut bacteria influences the absorption of nutrients. So that obviously has downstream effects. And the gut bacteria actually even manufactures some nutrients like vitamin K. Uh, and then it also produces some chemicals that influence our brain. So most of it, you've probably heard of serotonin, which is the calming neurotransmitter. Most of that is made in the gut. And then another calming one is called GABA. So there are studies out there on things like anxiety and depression showing that probiotics can make a difference. But why do we carry around five or 10 pounds of bacteria? It just seems odd, doesn't it? Well, as it turns out, that's what can help us adapt quickly. When you think about it, if you were to move to another country and start eating bark and beetles, we can't evolve quickly enough to adapt to that diet. But the bacteria in our gut can quickly evolve, and they've, they've proven that. So that's the good and the, the bad of the gut is it can change quickly. So what do we, how do we influence the gut? By what we eat, by medicines we take or have taken, antibiotics, steroids, you know, protonics, some of those things, and of course, stress. So this same Hippocrates, he was a pretty smart guy, said, let food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. So I hope you're not all having a donut while you're watching this. If so, put it down. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is sugar and brain health, because there's a definite proven detrimental effect. What we know is higher sugar levels disrupt memory, even in non-diabetics. And then diets rich in carbohydrate have an increase in dementia, whereas a high fat diet has a lower uh, risk of dementia. So this has such a big role that some people refer to Alzheimer's as type three diabetes. Uh, and we know that when your insulin goes up, it decreases the clearance of amyloid. Now amyloid is a, a protein that can deposit in the brain. We're not sure if it's cause or effect at this point, but uh, we do know that when your insulin is up, you're not clearing, out out, clearing it out as you should. So this is from uh, David Perlmutter, who's a neurologist who uh, writes about the role of grains and sugar in, in brain health. Uh, and this is looking at hemoglobin A1C, which reflects your average daily blood sugar for the last three months. So normal these days, and this is an old graph from 2005, normal these days is up to 5.6. But even you see, even in the normal range, the higher your hemoglobin A1C, the more your brain is shrinking per year. So this is a big deal when it comes to memory. So we say sugar is the new fat. So what do we do? We're, we're minimizing uh, sugar intake. So, you know, we've always been told to have plenty of uh, fruits and vegetables. And we know vegetables, everybody agrees vegetables are good. Uh, the fruits, I would say there's a spectrum. Uh, certainly the lower sugar fruits like berries um, are helpful and they have great nutrients and good fiber. Uh, the higher sugar ones like bananas uh, and things like that, you may want to save for a special treat. And people have questions about juicing. And the, the issue with juicing is that it takes the fiber out and so then you're left with more of the, the pure sugar response. So uh, if you do juice, I would leave all that good fiber stuff in there. It's, I know, not necessarily pleasant to drink, but it is helpful for you. But the best thing is just to eat the whole, the whole fruit. All right, so there are several foods that have been studied looking uh, at their impact on uh, cognition. So leafy greens, berries, uh, the olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil has some controversy, uh, nuts, wily, uh, oily fish such as salmon and things like that, avocado, eggs, turmeric, 
and fermented foods. This is like sauerkraut and kimchi and some of those things. Now we're gonna talk about a few of these individually. So let's talk blueberries. I think everybody knows blueberries are a superfood or a power food, uh, but they have been shown to have uh, compounds in them that protect the brain. And of course they support healthy digestion as well. And there's also some evidence saying that they improve working memory. So uh, a handful of blueberries in the morning uh, could be a very good thing. Garlic. So there are garlic extracts that you can take in supplement form. And that's what these studies are done. Again, there's some evidence that the extract protects your uh, nerve cells from toxicity. Uh, it improves the circulation in your brain, improves short-term recognition and memory in rats. We hope that it does the same in humans. And it protects the blood-brain barrier. So that's that's the wall between what's happening in your brain and what's happening in the blood. When that gets leaky, then your brain, your brain can become inflamed. Green tea. Uh, again, there's a supplement called EGCG, which is an extract of green tea. But it's interesting that uh, when people took this uh, EGCG, even if they had a high fat, high sugar diet, uh, it protected the brain against the effects. And it can also works as, work as a chelator and bind up some of the uh, metals that can be a problem. And it, when we say it modulates oxidative stress, oxidative stress is kind of the process of us rusting from the inside out. So we want things that uh, address oxidative stress. So green tea is one of them. All right, what about caffeine or coffee? Everybody loves their coffee, and actually coffee can be beneficial. So there's some evidence that it decreases the risk of type 2 diabetes. It may have some role in decreasing risk of Parkinson's, gallstones, which doesn't affect the brain, of course. Again, here's this amyloid plaque again, uh, decreased development of amyloid in coffee drinkers. And then here's this blood-brain barrier again. So it protects against disruption of that um, in, in animals with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. So now how much coffee is too much coffee? You know, uh, probably no more than four cups a day, but even two cups a day would probably be about right. All right, well, coffee in the morning, hopefully not alcohol in the morning, but what about alcohol in the evening? So, if you looked purely at alcohol, it can kill brain cells. Uh, so, so that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is how it impacts the process where the brain is cleaned out. It's called the lymphatic system. You've heard about the lymphatic system, which is your lymph nodes and things flowing through the body. The glymphatic system is the system that washes out your brain. So what we see here is, uh, you know, when there is no alcohol, uh, the, you, you see what the, the flow is in the brain. Um, and then when you see low alcohol consumption, there's better flow in the brain. However, more is not better because now you see medium alcohol shuts down that circulation. And so the brain isn't being cleaned out uh, at night. So a little bit of alcohol, again, you'll be hearing this theme of moderation uh, in all things. And so alcohol is one. I would say uh, a drink or two a few times a week would be appropriate. We would like low sugar drinks, of course, because we don't wanna be adding carbs to the situation. And you see that the benefit may be greater in people under 60. So if you're over 60, um, it's harder to justify a lot of alcohol consumption. All right, now I don't know if you've heard of MCT oil. It's medium chain triglyceride oil. It's a derivative of coconut oil. It's a, it's, if coconut oil was very purified, this is what MCT oil would be. And in fact, back in the dark ages when I was 
uh, residents, we used to add this to the formula of premature babies to give them healthy, clean fats. But uh, as it turns out, this is a good fuel for the brain. And so MCT oil improved short-term cognition in people with uh, Alzheimer's in that APOE4 gene, or oh, APOE4 negative gene, sorry. Uh, so that is something that you might wanna consider if, if you are able to tolerate it. Now, uh, some people mix it into their coffee or onto, into their oatmeal. It is an oil, so it can have a laxative effect. So you wanna be careful. It does have some benefits for weight and blood sugar as well. So, all right, so what about what diet is best? Uh, there's a few different approaches. So let's talk about intermittent fasting. Uh, you've probably heard about this, this is the rage. There are very different ways we can intermittently fast. Some where you just drop your calories to 500 calories a couple days a week and then eat normally. Um, but a more tolerable one is just making sure you're doing at least 12 to 14 hours between dinner and breakfast. Uh, some people will go as, as long as 16 or 18 hours between dinner and breakfast. And what we find that uh, is that the insulin goes down, it increases this BDNF, which is something that supports brain health, and it stimulates the mitochondria, which are the energy producers in our cells, and it decreases inflammation, and it increases connections between nerves in, in mice. So intermittent fasting seems to be something that most people are able to do, and uh, it can be very helpful. So this, the, uh, Diet that seems to be uh, showing promise is this MIND diet, which is a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. So the Mediterranean is, you know, um, olive oil and fish and grains and things like that. DASH is the dietary uh, approach for hypertension, and that's lots of vegetables, low fat, things like that. So the, and actually, if you followed either of those, that would be great. Um, and then the, uh, the ideal from a brain standpoint is to combine them. So what does that look like? Lots of green leafy vegetables and other vegetables, nuts, berries, beans, whole grains, fish, poultry, olive oil, and there's our wine, but you know the asterisk in moderation. And you wanna be limiting your saturated fats. So the red meat, the butter, cheese, uh, processed foods and uh, fast foods. All right, what about exercise? Uh, we all know that exercise is good. These are some different graphs, again, from David Perlmutter. Um, the first one is looking at fitness and uh, incidence of dementia. You see that high fitness levels are helpful. Uh, and then the, uh, this is the second is just a percentage. And then how long it takes to get to onset of dementia, you see that higher fitness levels uh, delay the onset quite significantly. Uh, and I will just mention what kind of exercise. It can be really any movement. Aerobic exercise is probably the most beneficial, but they looked at yoga, they looked at drumming, they looked at balance training, all of it, all of it plays a role and can be beneficial. What about brain training, brain exercises? This is interesting because you know there's a lot of programs out there that they're trying to sell us to improve cognitive health. And what they found was you improve performance on those tasks, you know, in the in the brain training uh, application, and maybe you improve a little bit on some closely related tasks. But there's not a huge amount of evidence that the brain training uh, improves everyday cognitive performance. So the main thing to do is really to make sure you're learning new things, whether it's music or a language or a computer or uh, something else. You, you just want to be stimulating your brain in different ways uh, to keep it, keep it alive and uh, exercising.
All right, what about sleep? So remember we talked about that glymphatic system. So that's what happens during sleep. So the lymphatic flow between brain cells increases by 60% when you're sleeping. So that it washes out all the waste that builds up, including amyloid, here we have that name again, which again, we don't know whether it's cause or effect, but it does seem to be uh, associated with, uh, with Alzheimer's or other dementias. This is when we consolidate memory. So uh, especially during rapid eye move or during uh, non rapid eye movement sleep. So we want to make sure we're getting enough good sleep. And some of these sleep aids that we take will make us close our eyes and check out for several hours, but it doesn't always give us a normal sleep cycle where we get the lymphatic flow and the consolidation of memory. So what do we need to do? You know, you know all this, right? Routine, you wanna be, you know, alcohol may get you to sleep, but it doesn't keep you asleep. So you wanna be careful on that. Manage your caffeine in the morning, avoid high stimulation before bed, avoid high sleep, uh, high sugar foods before bed. Uh, you might want to do something more complex like a piece of cheese and some avocado or something like that. You want a dark, cool room if you can. Uh, you want to limit your activities in the bedroom. And then you want to uh, use mindfulness or the breath to help to calm you down uh, for sleep. Stress. I'm sure none of us have experienced that recently. Uh, so we do know that uh, stress increases your cortisol and then cortisol uh, has an adverse effect on your brain and certain types of stress even suppress the uh, ability of your brain to make new connection. And so that will impact memory. I always like to throw in something about digital stress, about computers, because this was quite eye-opening for me. Now, when I first put this talk together, of course it was very much pre-COVID. And so now we've had to adjust our recommendations a little bit. But uh, this study showed, you know, 95% of teens online and way back in 2011, 78% of adults. I bet right now it's about 100% or 98%. The average computer user checks websites, checks 40 websites a day and switches programs every couple of minutes. So, uh, that's, that's keeping the brain very busy and distracted. This is a nice study that looked at the uh, effect of checking our email on heart rate and blood pressure. So you see here that when email is checked, the heart rate and blood pressure go up. So when you're somebody who's checking your email every two seconds, you know, you are, you are in fight or flight mode for much of the time. How about multitasking? I, I would love to, usually when I'm in a room, I say how many people are good at multitasking? And then I say, men, don't bother raising your hands, but it's a joke. However, it turns out that none of us are good at multitasking. So when, when the brain is overloaded with information, it triggers fight or flight, and we become less empathetic, which I'm sure you've all experienced when you're really trying to do multiple things and somebody comes in and asks you, you know, where the keys are, uh, you're probably not feeling very empathetic. Uh, but why do we do it? Why, why would we multitask if we're not good at it? Well, it releases a, a chemical called dopamine, which uh, it's, it's a response to novel stimulus and that keeps us uh, engaged and excited. So that's why we keep doing it. We, we like the buzz it gives us. So what do we do about this? We want to be very intentional in our tasks, doing one at a time, uh, completing similar tasks together, trying to limit your uh, email checking to a few times a day or even every couple of hours rather than every couple of minutes. But the more you can do that and focus on the task at hand, the more efficient you'll be and the less stressed you will be.
even though it doesn't feel like that. It is a habit that you have to kind of rewire yourself for. So what about mind-body uh, interventions? Well, we know that mind-body interventions improve cognitive function, everyday activity function, memory, resilience, mindfulness in older adults with mild cognitive impairment. Now, the, the quality of evidence was not high, but there are so many other benefits to mind-body interventions that it's, it's a good thing to have in your toolbox. Now, whether that is yoga or Tai Chi or Qigong or something like that, or whether it's simple breath work, you know, when we, when we get right down to it, it's using the breath to balance the nervous system. There are two parts of the nervous system, fight or flight, which we all know about, and then rest and digest, which is the calming part of the nervous system. And the way we balance our nervous system is with our breath. And specifically, we want our breath out to be longer than our breath in. So it's very simple. You, if you don't want to do the yoga or anything else, if you, if you are terrible at meditation, whatever, just breathe and make sure your out breath is longer than your in breath. Everybody can breathe. It's free. There's no side effects. You can do it when you're driving. You can do it when you're waiting in line at the store. You can do it while you're listening to this presentation. So just breathe. What about connection? As it turns out, social isolation is a big risk factor when it comes to health. Low social connection is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day or being having an issue with alcohol. And it's more harmful than a sedentary lifestyle and twice as harmful as obesity. And we know that higher social engagement uh, results in a lower risk of dementia. So what, how can we do that right now during COVID? Well, uh, there was a study on Facebook, senior Facebook users out in California, and those who had the most friends or social connections had better health. Now, I will say that those who augmented their online connection with offline connection had the best outcomes of all. So this is a time when, no, you can't be going to big group functions, but you can always say hello to your neighbor. You can go for walks and, and say hello to uh, others in, in the area. You can be connecting with family online or uh, you know the best you can. It certainly will get more challenging as we move into winter and we will have to get more creative, uh, but it is an important one, as you see, more important than, than walking around. So what about supplements? Everybody wants a magic supplement that's gonna protect them. Uh, and I wish it were that easy, but uh, the bottom line is that lifestyle is gonna be the thing. So there are lots of uh, research studies out there looking at different things. Uh, Omega-3 fish oil seems to be good for the brain. Now you'll see the cardiologists, you know, will tell you that there hasn't been great evidence for its benefit for the heart, but we do know it helps in the brain. So that's a good one. You want your vitamin D to be in a good range. You don't want it to be crazy high, but you want it to be appropriate. Vitamin E, can be helpful. You have to be careful with vitamin E. There's a lot of subtleties for that, so I wouldn't go rushing out to buy some. Acetyl L-carnitine is another one that can be helpful. And you might have seen these in, uh, you know, in various brain supplements. They have little bits of all of this. Uh, paracetam is another one. Lithium. Now you've heard of lithium with bipolar disorder in terms of, um, you know, a large dose of lithium. But there's a nutritional lithium, lithium orotate, that is helpful, particularly in de uh, anxiety, depression, and dementia uh, at very low doses. Ginkgo can be very helpful because it increases the circulation in the brain. And turmeric. Turmeric is a good one for just about anything that ails you because it's an anti-inflammatory. So we know when the brain is not working well, it's because it's inflamed. Uh, so the turmeric helps with that. Now you do wanna be checking with your physician 
uh, if you're considering adding these, because for instance, of course, the omega-3 and the turmeric can thin the blood, as can the ginkgo. So if you're on blood thinners, you don't want to be rushing right out and, and taking, uh, taking lots of those. So you want to be careful. But at least these show some promise. There are other, uh, these are just more uh, Bacopa you've heard of. B vitamins, interestingly, they help with energy and they help um, homocysteine, which is an inflammatory marker, but they don't really help your brain. Melatonin can help you fall asleep, but it doesn't necessarily help cognition. Uh, saffron is interesting. That's a spice that you've heard of, um, but of course it comes in supplement form as well. And there's been some really nice evidence showing that it helps with mild to moderate uh, dementia compared to uh, placebo and similar effect to uh, denazepil, so with fewer side effects. And then huperzine A and vinpocetine. And then they're looking now at ashwagandha and CBD as well. Ashwagandha is a, uh, what we call an adaptogen. It's an herbal medication that helps uh, to support a healthy stress response. And CBD, you know that that's being studied for everything. So the jury is out on how it impacts cognition. I wouldn't go rushing out getting CBD for cognition. There's some good studies for, for pain and anxiety, but, but not cognition yet. So is there anything good about, you know, getting a little bit older? Uh, yes, we have wisdom. So we have better judgment. We're better at screening out the negativity. We, we tend to use whole brain thinking and uh, not compartmentalizing. We're better at uh, making rational decisions. You see, you see I'm saying we, because uh, I'm right in there. Better verbal abilities, better spatial reasoning, and better at basic math. I think that's because we were balancing checkbooks and now nobody has to do that anymore. So, so there are some good things about uh, aging. All right, so in summary, you want to make sure if, if there's anything going on in your brain at any stage of the game, you want to make sure that uh, you have a good medical evaluation to see if there's anything correctable. You want to be uh, addressing lifestyle aspects. So low sugar, anti-inflammatory diet. So lower sugar, more healthy fats, intermittent fasting if you can, aerobic exercise if you can, but any movement is good, and you can call it movement. You don't have to call it active. Uh, you don't have to call it exercise if you don't like to exercise. Uh, brain training benefit. Brain training programs have some benefits, but learning new skills is really more beneficial. Sleep, resilience, social connection is important, and supplements are less helpful than lifestyle changes, as some of those antioxidants show promise.